Welcome to the series of the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation. We are already in study number six of 24. I'm sure you don't want to miss any of them. Our topic tonight is entitled, Written in Stone. To begin with, let us look at an amazing story recorded in Daniel chapter 6. After Darius the king of the Medes and Persians conquered Babylon, he executed all the Babylonian government officials except one man. That fortunate man was Daniel, a servant of the true God. Seventy years earlier, he had been carried from Judah to Babylon as a captive, and he was made to serve in the palace as an advisor to the Babylonian kings. Daniel became known throughout the empire for having an excellent spirit. As you can see in Daniel 5 verse 12, not only did King Darius spare Daniel, but he thought to set him over the whole realm. Daniel 6 and verse 3. When the media Persian officials learned that the king was going to promote an old Hebrew captive to rule over them, they were jealous and outraged. You know, jealousy is a natural human trait. Especially, they couldn't digest that a foreigner who came as a captive initially would be over them as president number one of the whole kingdoms of Medo and Persia. So they plotted to entice Darius to sign a law, knowing that Daniel was always praying to his God. It says in Daniel 6 and verse 7, all the presidents of the kingdom, the governors, and the princes, and the counselors, and the captains have consulted together to establish a royal statute and to make a firm decree that whosoever shall ask a petition of any god or man for 30 days save of thee, O king, he shall be cast into the den of lions. It is not that they cared for Darius, but Darius must have been flattered to know that they regarded him as a godlike figure. He did not see the trap they were trying to lay for the king's most trusted officer, Daniel. How did Daniel react when he knew that the king signed the decree prohibiting him or anyone to worship God and to pray to any other god than the king? Daniel 6 and verse 10 says, Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house, and his windows being open in his chamber toward Jerusalem. He kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. Daniel 6 and verse 10. Daniel had passed many other tests before in his life. In his very early age, he faced a death decree in Daniel chapter 2, and God had intervened then. So Daniel learned by experience to trust God, even in the face of death. He was ready to die than disobey the law of God. Daniel was not a coward. It says he opened the windows of his house, as he usually did, and faced toward Jerusalem and prayed, because it is written in 1 Kings 8, 35 and 36, if they pray toward this place and confess thy name and turn from their sin when thou afflictest them, then hear thou from heaven and forgive their sin, the sin of thy servants. So Daniel was obeying the words of God by looking towards Jerusalem and praying. We don't pray in that direction of Jerusalem, Jerusalem temple, 
now, for our temple is in heaven, and Jesus is the great high priest in heaven above. Just as they expected, the officials caught Daniel praying to God from his open window. They immediately informed the king that Daniel, president number one, is distrustful of the king's commandment. When King Darius discovered that he had been tricked and that his old friend was headed for the lion's pit, he tried every possible angle to deliver Daniel from the foolish law he had just signed. He took his time to see how he can save Daniel. But time was running out. Before sunset, he had to give the commandment in executing Daniel. The law of the Medes and Persians were such that even the king cannot change it. The king had to do this very painful signing of another document in executing Daniel. So the king gave the command and they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions. But the king spoke, saying to Daniel, Your God, whom you serve continually, he will deliver you. Daniel 6 and verse 16. The king knew that Daniel did the right thing in being faithful to his God, the living God. The king was also convinced that the God of Daniel would intervene and deliver Daniel from the power of the lions. What a testimony Daniel bore in the kingdom of Medes and Persians. All knew, including the king, that Daniel served God continually. Is that the testimony that you and I bear to the people around us? Daniel went to the lion's den and God rewarded his faithfulness by sending a mighty angel to shut the mouth of the lions. Daniel told the king who came to see him early next morning, my God had sent his angel and shut the lion's mouth that they have not hurt me. For as much as before him, innocency was found in me and also before thee, O king, I have done no hurt. Daniel 6, 22. Prophecy tells us that in the last days, God's people will have a similar decision regarding which king and which law they will obey. Let's now go to our first question of our study. Can God's moral law be amended or repealed? Jesus said, and it is easier for heaven and earth to pass than one tittle of the law to fail. Luke 16 and verse 17. If the law of the Medes and Persians cannot be changed, the law of God is surely an unchangeable law more than that. Jesus said it is easier for heaven and earth, which is part of God's creation, to disappear than even the slightest part of God's law to go away. Through the psalmist, God said, my covenant will I not break nor alter the thing that is gone out of my lips. Psalm 89, 34. 
God doesn't even alter any part of his covenant, the Ten Commandments, which he gave to man, written with his own fingers. They are perfect, and therefore they need no change. For how long will God's commandments remain? The Bible says, all his commandments are sure. They stand fast forever and ever. Psalm 111, 7 and 8. As God lives forever, his commandments are forever as well. In Malachi chapter 3 and verse 6, we read, For I am the Lord, I change not. God doesn't change, neither does his law change. They both are eternal and perfect. Therefore, they need no change. Man who is imperfect and disobedient by nature needs to change and come in line with God and his holy law. When we compare the verses about God and about his law, you see it is a similar description. For example, in Luke 18, 19, it says, God is good. And about the law in Romans 7, 12, it says, the law is good. Isaiah 5, 16 says, God is holy. Romans 7, 12 says, the law is holy. Deuteronomy 32 and verse 4 says, God is just. Romans 7, 12 says, the law is just. Matthew 5, 48, God is perfect. Psalm 19, 7, the law is perfect. 1 John 4, 8, God is love. Romans 13, 10, it says the law is a law of love. In Exodus 9, 27, we read God is righteous. In Psalm 19, 9, it says the law is righteous. In Deuteronomy 32, 4, it says God is truth. In Psalm 119, 142 and 151, it says God's law and commandments are truth. 1 John 3, 3, it says, God is pure. Psalm 19, 8 says, the law is pure. John 4, 24 says, God is spiritual. Romans 7, 14 says, the law is spiritual. Malachi 3, 6, God is unchangeable. Matthew 5, 18, the law is unchangeable. Genesis 21, 33, God is eternal. Psalm 111, 7 and 8 says, the law is of God is eternal. God's law cannot be changed because it's the transcript of his character. The glorious words in scripture that describe God we saw also describes his law. God's law is his character in writing. It is no more possible to change God's law than to change God himself. If someone tries to find fault with God's law, they are in reality finding fault with God himself. And who would like to do that? I want to tell you about a stone. Los Lunas Decalogue stone is a large boulder on the side of the hidden mountain near Los Lunas New Mexico, about 35 miles south of Albuquerque, that bears a very regular inscription carved into a flat panel. The stone is also known as Los Lunas, mystery stone or commandment rock. The inscription is interpreted to be an abridged version of the Decalogue or the Ten Commandments in a form of Paleo-Hebrew, a letter group resembling the tetragrammaton YHWH or Yahweh, makes three appearances. The stone is controversial in that some claim the inscription is pre-Columbian and therefore proof of early somatic contact with the Americas. That is an interesting piece of stone indeed. Our next question, number two, according to the Bible, what is sin? If we ask people to define what sin is, each one will come up with their own definition. But we need to ask God 
because he knows exactly what is sin. And in the word of God, God has given us the definition to sin. It says, sin is the transgression of the law. 1 John 3, 4, God's law of the Ten Commandments. When we transgress that, it is sin. Remember, the law is holy, which reflect God's character. When we transgress it by disobeying its commands, we are sinning. When we obey it, we become like God in character, holy, just, and good. But when we go away from it, we are sinning. Paul also wrote, By the law is the knowledge of sin. Romans 3 and verse 20. The law is like a mirror. What shows us our problem. We all have a knowledge of sin only because of the existence of a law that reflects our problem. The devil hates the law because it makes us aware that we need a savior from sin. Romans 4 and verse 15 states, where there is no law, there is no transgression. The law cannot save anyone, but it shows us God's perfection and our imperfection. Question number three, to what law does 1 John 3, 4 refer? Paul wrote, I had not known sin, but by the law, for I had not known lust, except the law had said, thou shalt not covet. Romans 7 and verse 7. Paul quotes one of the Ten Commandments, which says, thou shalt not covet. And he informs us that it is this law, the law of the Ten Commandments, that reveals sin to each one of us. Are the societies of the world greatly sinning? I want to quote U.S. News and World Report. Every hundred hours, more youth die in the streets than were killed in the Persian Gulf War. Isn't that startling? That's a heinous crime that is going on on a daily basis around the world. That's just one part of the law that is being transgressed so badly. Another report says the average 18-year-old has witnessed 200,000 violent acts, including 40,000 murders on the television. People are viewing crime. Now, we may not be involved in the very act, but enjoying and witnessing these acts are also sin in God's sight. For we take pleasure in it, and our thoughts also enjoy it. Every sin that a person commits is condemned at least by one of the Ten Commandments. This is why God's law is called broad in Psalm in 1996, and it's called perfect in Psalm 19.7. It covers the whole duty of man, Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 13. When we are aware of our sin, we look for a savior. So the devil especially hates the law because it sends us to Jesus, our savior, where we can receive forgiveness. We'll go to question number four. Did Jesus keep the Ten Commandments? The Bible tells us, I have kept my Father's commandments, John 15 and verse 10. The Bible says in 1 Peter 2 21 that Jesus did not sin. It means he did not transgress God's law because sin is defined as transgression of God's commandments. So Jesus indeed kept the Ten Commandments the most perfect way. And he set an example for all of us that we might follow the path of obedience. The status stones. I want to tell you something very interesting about the lowly shrimp. It has a most marvelous manner of changing clothes six or eight times a year through a process called molting. Apparently, a new suit 
begins to grow underneath the old skin. By scraping around the rocks, the shrimp begins to shred and loosen the older outer layer, which soon uh, merges off completely, revealing the classy new covering underneath. At the time of each molting, another fascinating phenomenon occurs. In response to some built-in instinct, every shrimp deliberately places a grain of sand in a special place on its head. At every molting, the cycle, the little rock is discharged, discharged along with the old skin and a new grain of sand is put carefully in its place. Because of this unique function of these rocks, they have been named as status stones or stones of standing. They are absolutely necessary for the survival of these tough marine animals. Without them, the shrimp would be constantly confused and disoriented. In the wake of surging tides and the currents, they tumbled over and over and upside down. It is only by feeling the slight tug of gravity on the rock in their head that they can recognize whether they are upside down or right side up. In his great love and wisdom, God has provided this mechanism to enable the lowly shrimp to keep a dignified balance amid the turbulent elements of its habitat. How did we get these details of this creature? Several years ago, a marine biologist conducted an experiment on shri several shrimp which had been placed in a large aquarium. In the bottom of the aquarium, the scientists played, placed steel filings instead of sand. When molting time came, each of the shrimp picked a piece of steel instead of a rock and placed it in its head. Then the biologists brought a powerful electromagnet and placed it over the top of the aquarium. Immediately, all the shrimp flipped upside down and began to swim around in an inverted position. The pull of the magnet on the steel's silver was stronger than the tug of gravity, and they believed that up was down and down was up. To make this experiment more dramatic, the scientists then brought a shrimp from the ocean and placed it in the aquarium. Naturally, this newcomer on the scene was paddling around in the proper upright position. Can you imagine the dismay that probably was provoked by the appearance of this odd one in the tank? It seems highly likely that some nasty whispers began to circulate within those troubled waters. Who does this nut think he is? Who is he trying to impress? Does this weirdo think that he's going to show us a better way to swim? Why is he doing it upside down? You see, that steel in the head, the wrong way crowd, had no clue that the recent visitor was really the only shrimp that was swimming correctly. They had always depended on two things to prove they were right side up, their feelings and what the majority around them were doing. But now, that their status tone had been tampered with, they were deceived into believing a lie on both counts. Isn't that an interesting story of the shrimps? Well, we'll go to question number five. How many people have sinned? The Bible tells us, 
for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 3, 23. Did you realize, dear friend, if God's law could be changed, it would not be necessary for Jesus to die on the cross. The fact that Jesus paid the penalty for sin and died is the biggest proof that the law of God is unchangeable. Have you thought about that? Would you like to know God's plan for our broken world as revealed in Bible prophecy? Want practical, trusted solutions for your biggest challenges? Encouraging and enlightening, Amazing Facts Bible Study Guides provide 27 Bible-based topical lessons with beautiful graphics and straightforward answers that are easy to understand. Each study guide leads you toward real, relevant Bible answers for the most important questions in your life. How can I have healthier relationships? When and how will Jesus come again? And so much more. Don't leave your future to chance. Transform your life with truths from the Amazing Facts Bible Study Guides. Available in English, Hindi, Tamil, and Telugu. Don't wait. Order your complete set of study guides today by visiting bookstore.aftv.in. What is the punishment for living a life of sin? The scripture tells us the wages of sin is death. Romans 6 and verse 23. All of us are supposed to die for all have sinned. But thank God for his divine intervention for each one of us. Let us go to question number seven. Some say that the Ten Commandments are not binding for New Testament Christians. What does Jesus say about this? Now, what matters is what Jesus says. When the rich young ruler came to Jesus with a question about eternal life, Jesus told him something very plainly that we need also to remember. He said, if thou wilt enter life, keep the commandments. Matthew 19, 17. If the commandments are no longer to be followed, then it was meaningless for Jesus to make that statement. Isn't that right? Also, Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. John 14 and verse 15. We keep the commandments as an expression of our love for Jesus who died for our sins. Revelation 22, 14 says, Blessed are they that do His commandments. God pronounces a blessings on those who follow Him. Now, if the commandments are not to be obeyed by God's people in the New Testament, then all these verses should not have been there in the New Testament. A special blessing is pronounced even in the last book. Those who obey God's commandments are blessed, it says. Also in Psalm 1, verses 1 and 2, we read that those who delight in the law of God are indeed the blessed people of God. John wrote, Here is the patience of the saints, here are they that keep the commandments of God, Revelation 14 and verse 12. Do you want to be a saint of God? The Bible tells us that we need to keep God's commandments and have the faith in Jesus. A saint is in God's sight, is someone who has both of these. And I'm sure you want to be one of them. We need to express our love through obedience. The New Testament plainly teaches that God's people will keep His commandments. All of us know that the world is in big trouble today because so many people no longer feel it is important to obey God's law. The Bible speaks of our day by saying it is time for thee, Lord, to work 
for they have made void thy laws. Psalm 119, 126. Let's go to question number eight. How is it possible to keep the commandments? Paul wrote in Romans chapter 8, verses 3 and 4, God sending His own Son condemned sin in the flesh that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. By Jesus living a sinless life, He condemned sin in His life. And then He paid the penalty for our sins by dying on the cross. He then comes into our lives and brings that righteous character to be a part of our character. Paul said, He which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Philippians 1 and verse 6. It is God through the Holy Spirit who works in us. He does not do a half job. He does it completely. He that begins completes it. Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith, the Bible says. The apostle said, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Philippians 4, 13. We do not have the strength on our own. It is the presence and the power of Christ in our lives that strengthens us to do what God wants us to do. God alone can help us to obey Him through the power of the Holy Spirit that He freely gives each one of us who desires. When a person is born again, Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit, moves into that person's life and miraculously makes obedience possible. Let's go to question number nine. What is the old covenant? Why did it fail? The Bible says, And he declared unto you his covenant, which he commanded you to perform, even ten commandments, and he wrote them upon two tables of stone. Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 13. The children of Israel, they promised to keep it after God declared it. But they thought they could keep in their own strength. All of them miserably failed right at Mount Sinai, at the golden calf worship. Then Moses rushed down as he was inspired by God, he sees this terrible sight and he breaks the two tables of stone because they failed to obey it. And after God's people later repented, God wrote the same law. He renews the covenant with them. Paul wrote about the people. For finding fault with them, he saith, I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 8. The fault with the old covenant was with the people, not with God or His law. The Bible says in Psalm 19 and verse 7, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Let's go to our next question. Upon which law is the new covenant based? The Bible says, For this is the covenant that I will make, saith the Lord, I will put my laws into their minds and write them in their hearts. Hebrews 8 and verse 10. The two covenants were agreements between God and His people. The old covenant failed because it was based upon faulty promises and works of the people. They said in Exodus 24 and verse 7, All that the Lord had said, we will do and be obedient. The new covenant, on the other hand, it succeeds because 
It is God's law written in our hearts, and it's based on Jesus' promise and his miracles working power to enable us to do it. Hebrews 8 and verse 10 says, I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts. A person's entire nature is changed, so he finds doing God's will a pleasure. Notice that the new covenant is based on the same law, but it is written in a different place, in a better place in our hearts, based on better promises, God's promises. Let's go to question number 11. Doesn't living under grace by faith make keeping God's law non-essential? Apostle Paul wrote, What then? Shall we sin because we are not under law, but under grace? God forbid. Romans 6 and verse 15. Grace is not a license to sin. On the contrary, grace is to empower us not to sin. God's grace works two ways. It pardons the penitent sinner and then over empowers him to overcome sin by rendering perfect obedience to God's law by the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. How does faith and law connect? The apostle wrote, Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid, yea, we establish the law. Romans 3 and verse 31. Faith, instead of taking us away from obedience, enables and strengthens us to obey God's law. Those who have been forgiven by Jesus for breaking his law are doubly duty bound to obey his law. And sensing his blessed forgiveness, they are more desirous and happy to follow Jesus. Let's go to question number 12. Are people saved by keeping the law? Paul wrote, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. No one is saved by keeping God's law. We are all saved by the miracle working grace of Jesus Christ. But those who are saved, who are transformed by the grace of Jesus, will want to obey his law as an expression of their love and thanksgiving to him. Obedience is the surest evidence that one is saved by grace because only grace can enable someone to obey God. Let's go and see what Dr. Billy Graham had to say in his My Answer, does God still expect us to keep the Ten Commandments? The late Dr. Graham answers it. The Ten Commandments are just as valid today as when God gave them to Moses over 3,000 years ago. Jesus said, I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, nor the least stroke, of a pen will by any means disappear from the law. And he quotes Matthew 5, 18. Yes, good Bible scholars across denominations who have understood the role of the law in the plan of salvation have believed that the Ten Commandments of God are abiding and they are indeed eternal. Let's go to question number 13. What motivates a person to obey God's law? Paul said in Romans 13 and verse 10, Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. It is love for God that motivates a true Christian to render obedience to God's law. If anyone obeys the law in a legalistic way, it is of no value. We obey it not for obedience sake, but for love's sake. Whatever we give to God, 
love and cheerfulness should characterize it. For the Bible says, God loves a cheerful giver. Jesus said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. Matthew 22, 37 to 39. Love must be complete. Love must be full. True, we all love God, and we all do something for Him. But the question comes to us, not if we love God, but how much do we love God? Do we love Him fully and completely? John wrote, This is the love of God, that we keep His commandments. 1 John 5 and verse 3. Love is the magnis magnificent motivator. The first four commandments have to do with our duty to God. When I love Him, obeying those commands is a pleasure. The last six commandments embrace my duty to the people. If we love people, we will not want to do anything that would hurt them. Isn't that right? Love, as we saw, fulfills the law because law and love cannot be separated in God's sight and in the life of a born-again Christian. Question number 14. Can I be a true Christian without keeping His commandments? Well, John gives us the answer. And hereby we do know that we know Him if we keep His commandments. 1 John 2, 3. Keeping God's commandments by His grace and by His Spirit is the biggest evidence we can have that we truly know God. Because knowing God is not a theoretical knowledge in the Bible, but it is an experimental knowledge which is carried out in one's life. John added, He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. 1 John 2, 4. That's a pretty strong statement from the loving apostle. Many people know about God, but they do not know God. How to know if you know God or you just know about God? The fruit of obedience to God's law is the evidence. John calls those who are serving God with their lips but are not serving God through obedience as liars. Remember, to obey is better than sacrifice. Let's go to question number 15. Are some Old Testament laws no longer binding upon Christians? Having abolished the law of commandments contained in ordinances, Ephesians 2.15. These ordinances are the commandments that Jesus abolished. They are not the law of the Ten Commandments, but the law, as it says here, contained in ordinances. Remember when Jesus died that Good Friday, that Passover, the veil of the temple was torn the precise moment Jesus gave his breath away. And the Passover lamb was supposed to die at that moment. Prophet Daniel predicted this very moment Jesus died. He said in Daniel 9.27, He shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. So when Jesus died, He put an end to all those laws pertaining to sacrifice and offerings because they were pointing forward to Him and he fulfilled it on the cross. So, when type met anti-type, when shadows met substance, when they met together on the cross and kissed each other, that was the end of it. Yearly Sabbaths, meat offerings, drink offerings, etc. 
in Leviticus 23, we see they all prefigured the plan of salvation through Jesus Christ. And therefore, they ended at the cross. Moral law or ceremonial law? Which one ended at the cross? It is the ordinances that regulated the priesthood and the sacrificial system that were abolished because they pointed to Jesus. You can see that in Colossians 2, 13 to 17. He fulfilled them as the true Lamb of God. Let's go to question number 16. Whom does the devil especially hate? John saw and he wrote, and the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keeps the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Revelation 12 and verse 17. Beloved, Satan hates and is infuriated with God's end time people, the people who obey God's commandments and teach people that there is divine power given for the sinner to become a saint. Now, if you have both of these, Jesus Christ and God's commandments, then you have the Savior's approval and Satan's wrath. Remember, if God is for us, who can be against us? We don't need to fear the enemy because we have a friend on our side. Let's take our last question. What are some of the glorious rewards of keeping God's law? The Bible tells us, These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. John 15 and verse 11. God wants us to be happy. He wants us to be joyful. And He wants our joy to be full as well. It is by abiding in Him and obeying Him in love and faith, God's joy becomes ours. The wise man wrote, He that keepeth the law, happy is he. Proverbs 29, 18. In this sorrow-filled world, we can still find true happiness in obedience to God's law. On the other hand, the wicked who transgress God's law have sorrow in store. King David, the man of God's own heart, wrote, Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Psalm 119, 165. In this world of strife and war, in an environment of distress and confusion, everyone is seeking for peace. But peace comes to us through Jesus Christ alone, the Prince of Peace, and in perfect obedience to His law. Great peace is promised to the obedient because happiness, joy, and peace and more abundant living comes to those who obey God's law. Therefore, David said, God's commandments are more to be desired than gold. Psalm 19 and verse 10. Do you desire to have a loving relationship with Jesus that will lead you to be one of His joyful, obedient children? Dearly beloved, we have seen tonight that God wants you to have peace. God wants you to have happiness. God wants you to have all the blessings. But it is sin and transgression that robs us all of it. And therefore, Jesus wants to cleanse us and fill us and empower us with His Holy Spirit so that He can write God's law in our hearts. That law is eternal. It is a reflection of His character. Don't you want to have the character of God and be a part of His eternal kingdom? Let's pray. 
Dear God, we thank you for what you wrote on stone. May you write the same law through your Holy Spirit in our hearts and minds and help us to express our love to you by obeying you wholeheartedly from our hearts. Help us, Lord, to always follow you. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Can't get enough amazing facts Bible study? You don't have to wait until next week to enjoy more truth-filled programming. Visit the Amazing Facts India Media Library at AFTV.in. At AFTV.in, you can enjoy video presentations in multiple languages as well as uplifting material to read, all free of charge, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, right from your computer or mobile device. Visit AFTV.in today. hungry, and you gave me something to eat. Inasmuch as you do it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. know a marathon is one of the longest and hardest races a person can run. But did you hear about the ultra marathon they used to have in Australia? It was 544 miles from Melbourne to Sydney. It attracted as many as 150 world-class athletes. But then something happened that no one would ever forget. In 1983, a 61-year-old potato farmer named Cliff Young decided to enter the race. Uh, people were very amused because he had on rubber galoshes over his boots. And when the race began and all the runners took off, sure enough, old Cliff was left behind, shuffling along very slowly, but he was shuffling very persistently. Normally, during this seven-day race, the runners would go about 18 hours running and then they'd sleep for six hours. But nobody ever told Cliff that. When the other runners stopped to rest during the night, Cliff just kept on running. Some people were afraid old Cliff was gonna have a heart attack and they were asking the race organizers to show mercy and stop the crazy old man, but he would have none of it. Each day, he was gaining on the pack because when they were sleeping, he was plodding along. During the last night of the race, Cliff passed all of these world-class athletes. Not only was Cliff able to run that 544-mile race without dying, he won, beating all the other racers by nine hours, breaking the record and becoming a national hero in the process. What's really amazing is when they told him that he had won the $10,000 prize, he looked confused and said he didn't know there was a prize, and he decided to share it with the other runners. When asked how he was able to run all night long, Cliff responded that he grew up on a farm where they had about 2,000 head of cattle, and because they couldn't afford horses, he used to have to round them up on foot, sometimes running two and three days nonstop. So, throughout the race, he just imagined he was chasing after the cows and trying to outrun a storm. Old Cliff's secret was to keep on running while others were sleeping. You know, the Bible tells us that the race is not necessarily to the swift. Something like Aesop's parable of the tortoise and the hare, the tortoise just kept on plodding along, 
That's why Jesus tells us in Matthew 24, 13, he that endures unto the end, the same will be saved. Now you might slip and fall during the race. You might even get off to a bad start. But in the Christian race that we run, the main thing is you want to finish well. Keep on running, friends, and don't give up. Have you ever wondered what it will be like when Christ returns? Well, Amazing Facts has created this beautifully illustrated 50-page magazine that talks about the major themes of his soon return. It talks about the signs of Christ's coming. What is a secret rapture and how can you prepare? It talks about the judgment and the 144,000. Who are they? It talks about the millennium and the earth made new. All of this packed into one beautiful magazine you'll enjoy reading and sharing with friends. To order your copy today, please visit bookstore.aftv.in. For more than 50 years, Amazing Facts has been boldly sharing Bible truth around the world in response to Jesus' commission to preach His gospel to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. Thank you for your prayers and support.